I'm going to start with what, what philosophy can offer to neuroscience. Actually, there are many ways of doing philosophy, and uh, each of them has something different uh, to contribute. There, there are many kinds of philosophy which study, study in great depth and detail a human experience, what it means to be a human, uh, but also experience uh, what it means to, to, to feel. Um, and uh, these kinds of studies can, are part of uh, what neuroscience uh, maybe needs to be uh, measured against, these kinds of understandings of the human person. Um, uh, another thing that philosophy does is, very well is examine presuppositions, examine the, the, the questions that are being asked. Uh, and, um, and that is very helpful for neuroscientists who sometimes um, get into a pattern uh, like the comp computational theory um, that is productive uh, as a research method uh, but leaves a lot of questions uh, unasked or, or makes a lot of assumptions that just sort of start to become taken for granted with time. And philosophy is very good at unearthing those questions again. And um, third, uh, just um, the ability to play with ideas. I mean, one of the great things about philosophy uh, is that we don't do experiments, we don't need a lot of money, uh, we don't need uh, a lot of equipment, and so we have a lot of freedom to experiment in another way which is uh, with ideas, um, because it doesn't really cost that much to fail in <laughs> philosophy. It's a great thing. Um, and so we are able to sort of expand the theoretical imagination and say, well, maybe, maybe thinking it's like this, uh, because we don't have to ask for money to run an actual experiment on the idea. We can play with that idea for a while, um, which is uh, a luxury that scientists don't have but it's something that can eventually come in and help to inform neuroscience. Coming back from neuroscience to philosophy, um, there, for me personally, I, I can't imagine being a philosopher without neuroscience and other scientific disciplines. Uh, scientists themselves are very imaginative thinkers. Um, they have to do their thinking within certain constraints because they have to run experiments and they have to measure things, right? And they need models. They need to make predictions and other sorts of things. But in, in, in the face of those challenges, they are extremely imaginative. And also, of course, uh, there is a lot of data that comes out of neuroscience that needs to be um, interpreted and thought about and can be thought about in many different ways. I think that's also really important. Um, so uh, I would say that neuroscience, in some ways, is a constraint on philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there is a lot of discussion now about the use of data uh, that's coming out of neuroscience. And this is sort of related to um, the data of genetics, right? And that, that can be very personal information. Um, and, uh, and the use of that data, I think, has to be protected and considered very carefully. I think that's one of the biggest issues that's being examined right now. Um, Probably a lot of people have more to say about that. I want to highlight another thing that is ethical, though maybe not in the sense that we think of as ethical, and that is, is that um, neuroscience uh, is uh, a profession uh, within the academy, but uh, within society, you know, um, and it competes uh, within neuroscience. Neuroscientists compete with one another for, for funds, and they compete with other disciplines for funds and so forth, and they compete for the attention of the public and so forth. And um, that sometimes leads, not just in neuroscience, but in all the sciences, to a uh, temptation to exaggerate uh, what the science can do, because of course you want to get the funders excited to give you however many millions or billions you need. Um, and um, that sort of selling of neuroscience is ethical. It's ethical not, not merely in the, in, in the sense of we have finite resources and we have finite money to spend on science, right? Um, 
but also in the sense uh, that that selling of neuroscience really it ha we have seen in the past 30 years has an enormous impact on people's image of themselves. Um, and, you know, uh, neuroscientists are not maybe as guilty as maybe AI specialists in, 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 the, in this of selling to the public a certain image of what the person is. But they, they play a role in that as well. And I, I do think that that is an ethical part of science. I think the workshop uh, sponsored by CNET is very important. Activities of this kind are, are critical, uh, but they are part of a larger uh, project of CNET, as I understand it. Um, and, um, you know, neuroscientists are under a lot of pressure uh, to produce research, to get grants, to publish in big journals and so forth. And without institutional help, we cannot ask them uh, to step back and consider ethical questions uh, or philosophical implications or their impact on society. Um, the institutional environment uh, makes uh, strong demands on their time and energy. Um, and if we want them mm, to take a different role or, or, or to conduct uh, their research differently or any, any modification, that needs to be made possible uh, through the institutional environment. Um, and CNET is um, trying to make a difference in that area. I mean, we could not be here um, to, to talk to one another and to have this time face-to-face -face asking questions that neuroscientists don't normally have time uh, to, to, to ask and normally don't have the opportunity to discuss not only with other neuroscientists, with philosophers, unless an institution makes it possible um, because um, in their university maybe they have some opportunity but not like this one. Mm -hmm.